Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Brister. I'm an elder here at House of Grace, and I just want to take a moment to thank you for joining us here at House of Grace. There are a lot of great churches in Blakely County, but you chose us because we feel like something special is happening right here. Some of y'all are excited to be here. Some of y'all still love your neighbor. <laughs> and we love the fact that you love your neighbors. If you're a guest here at House of Grace, we want to thank you and welcome you. Uh, just to give you a little heads up on what's happening right now, first of all, your babies and toddlers are welcome to join us over in Children's Church. Uh, kids up to grade five, we're going to dismiss you guys later. You guys are welcome to stay with us for worship. As you can see, our amazing band is waiting on me to get out of the way. That's right, they're amazing. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have the words on the screen so you can join us and you don't have to feel like you're awkward because you don't know this song. It's cool. Most of us don't. The words are right behind, will be right behind me as we sing. Uh, but we're going to do something a little bit different this morning because we always like doing things differently at House of Grace. So everybody stand to your feet and join me as we say a prayer over today's service. As soon as you recognize what I'm saying, join in with me. Our Father. Say it with me. Don't repeat me. <laughs> Our, Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holy Spirit, take my hand now, lead me out in the living water. You're the wellspring, you're stirring, you're the life for your sons and daughters. Eyes are open to the unseen, and my faith is arising in me. So bless the Lord now, sing it out loud, come and give the Lord His glory. Y'all ready? You're calling me deeper, deeper still. You're calling me deeper, deeper still. So I'm going deeper, deeper still into your love because your love keeps going. Deeper, deeper still. You're calling me deeper, deeper still. So I'm going deeper, deeper still into your love, into your love. Shout it out. There is healing in the water. Oh, Jesus, you're the river, and we'll never find the end. There is freedom in the water. There is healing in the water. Oh, Jesus, you're the river, and we'll never find the end. Give me a shout. Calling me deeper, deeper still. So I'm going deeper, deeper still. Into your love, because your love keeps going. Deeper, deeper still. You're calling me deeper, deeper still. So I'm going deeper, deeper still. Into your love, into your love. And we'll never find the end There is freedom 
You know, my favorite part of that song, because God revealed it to me this week, is, oh Jesus, you're the river, and we'll never find the end. He is an inexhaustible wealth of everything that we could ever need, and so much more. He has an inexhaustible wealth of love for us through our mistakes, our mishaps, our pasts, and our presence, and our future mistakes, because we're still human and we're still breathing. So he has an inexhaustible wealth. Let's go deeper. Bye. 
Jesus loves us so much. But the way to access and tap into all that he has for us is to let him be enthroned. Not Jesus come in and look what I've done. Jesus come in and look what I've got going on. Jesus come in and, and look at my acts of obedience and service to you in this area and this area. But Jesus, come in. I don't have a red carpet, but all I have is yours. I may not have an ornate throne, but you can have my favorite seat. You can have the best spot. Hmm. This is my welcoming. This is my invitation to invade the hidden rooms inside my heart. heart. Come take your place inside my heart. This is the song I sing, a holy habitation for my King. Come take your place inside my heart, heart. Come be enthroned inside my heart. You fill this place with endless wonder. Your embrace is what we're at. And all you are is all I'm living for. You fill this place with endless wonder, and your embrace is what we're after. All you are is all we're living for. You fill this place, God. You fill this place with endless wonder and your embrace is what we're after and all you are is all we're living for. This is my welcoming. This is my invitation to invade the hidden rooms inside my heart. is the song I sing, a holy habitation to my King. Come take your place inside my heart, heart. Come be enthroned inside my heart. Dark. 
you 
there are dark places in our hearts and in our minds and God wants you to open that door. The key to opening the doors of your heart is confession. Confess your sins to God. Let Him in. Let the light of God come into your heart and set you free. And you'll be free to worship indeed. You set us free. Oh Lord, we need you every breath. You set us free. You set us free. Sometimes a dark place isn't a hidden sin that we necessarily are purposely hiding. Sometimes a dark place in our heart is as simple as what he revealed to me this morning. I've been dealing with some things in my body, and yesterday I really reached a low place of discouragement. And I cried for a moment, and then I cried out to God, and I said, I just want to be well. I just want to be well. My body didn't change, and it still hasn't yet. But this morning, as I continue to take the medication, I paused, and I said, God, I had to wait till a minute. I said, God, I want you more than I want to be well. He wants us to be well. But he revealed a dark place in my heart that I had been seeking him for wellness, not for him. I had been seeking him for what he had to offer, but he's already given me everything. So sometimes we don't even realize. It doesn't mean you've got some hidden dark. Maybe it's something that you don't even realize that's keeping you from all that God has for you. He's here. And if you're his child, he's with you everywhere you go. Like it or not, because he's the best daddy in the world. He is a good, good father. He is a good, good lover of our soul. He has our best interest at heart at all times. favorite things about worship is that it's for everybody. You don't have to have a degree in worship. You don't have to have a certain amount of experience or a certain level of expertise. If you're saved today, you can worship. And that's at House of Grace, we, we kind of have a, a phrase that Pastor Joey has coined as the all skate. We're all in. Every one of us can participate in it. You guys can have a seat. Thank you, praise band. You guys are amazing. Somebody give it up for the praise band. You know, these, uh, our praise band, we, we, we brag on them a little bit, but they don't do it because they enjoy just getting up and playing instruments. They do it because they enjoy worshiping God. And it really shows, doesn't it? that they don't just come up here and perform. They, they just get up and worship and y'all get to join them. And that's just amazing, I love that. So, as you guys have figured out, today is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, yeah, that's a, it's a day off, it's our first holiday since like February. Um, and a lot of us are grilling, a lot of us are sunburnt because we spent too much time at the pool yesterday. Um, but let's not forget that Memorial Day actually has 
a meaning. There's something behind that. It's not just an excuse to grill out. Memorial Day is a day, a holiday, that our nation set aside as a special place to remember people who died with an act of service to bring us the freedom to grill out on the weekends. And I just want to take an opportunity. Today is not about veterans. That's Veterans Day. This is about the people who have lost their life in service to our country. So if you have lost someone, a loved one, a friend, a relative, a guy you were deployed with 200 years ago, if you've lost anybody in active duty, I'd like for you to stand up for just a second. Not because we're honoring you, but we're remembering the people that you're remembering today. Amen? Amen. So guys, let's just, everybody stand up and let's give a big round of applause to everyone who has ever helped our country. Thank you so much. Whew. Well, welcome again to House of Grace. Uh, my name is John Brister. I'm your host for today. Um, we want to first talk about, there are lots and lots of great ministries here at House of Grace. If you're new or new again to House of Grace, there are places you can get plugged in all over the building. We have great men's and women's ministries. We've got ministries for our high school, our middle school, our kids department. We've even got Silver Sisters and we've got other ministries just all over the place doing very specialized things. But we also have a lot of fun things going on for everybody. You don't have to sign up ahead of time. You can just show up and have a great time with it. And probably one of the biggest things that we do is our first Sunday prayer, which is next weekend, the first Sunday of the month. Go figure. It's funny how that happens. We, we do that as our sunrise prayer. And you guys have been here on the first Sunday of the month, like for service. And you've seen the results of what these guys have been plowing through the morning, the morning of, right? So this is an opportunity, everybody, if, if you have a pulse, check, do you have a pulse? You have a pulse, you can participate in Sunrise Prayer. 9 a.m. right here at House of Grace. It's back there in this room over here, but if you don't know where that room is, that's cool, we'll show you. Amen? Um, another great fun thing that we can do as everybody is uh, this Tuesday is opening day for our softball season. And, uh, it's a lot of fun if you ever, if you just need a good laugh. You've come to the right place. If you just, if you just really enjoy like belly laughter, just wait till I get up to bat. Um, it, it, it gets pretty ugly at that point, but um, we have a lot of fun. We get to do that as a family. Somebody say family. Because look around, we're family. Even if this is your first week, welcome to the family. Because uh, I, I had a coworker who came and he, he was in Warner Robins, so he wasn't gonna drive all the way to Cochran like every day and stuff like that, you know. Even though we drive up there to go to work, but that's a different story. <laughs> but he came down and he visited with us, and he visited us with us like three times over the course of a year. In the meantime, he was going to a different church in Warner Robins, you know, the kind of church that he grew up in and that kind of thing. And he said, you know, it's fun. After a year, they're finally treating me like House of Grace did on day two. That's a testimony to you guys. Because you guys don't meet strangers. You just meet another lost brother or sister that you've just been looking forward to meeting again. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Oh my goodness. And House of Grace, you guys get it because we're not just focused on the local community and missions. We do missions within our community. We do it globally and we do it internationally. Um, Today, we actually have one of our missionaries, Cody, if you'll stand up for just a second. <laughs> Cody's my personal favorite missionary because he lived with me for a little while. <laughs> you know, I'm a little biased in that. Um, but Cody is joining us uh, from YWAM in Colorado Springs. We're gonna hear a lot about what he's got going on on Wednesday. He's gonna have a special opportunity to speak to us. So if you're interested in what's going on in his life, come Wednesday, but also come see him after service because he's got appointments that he's scheduling to meet up with you guys and have dinner with you because um, he likes to eat. <laughs> um, ushers, if y'all will go ahead and come forward, we're gonna collect our tithes and offerings. but. So when we're talking about international missions and, and missions in general, 
I was just pondering on John 3.16. You know, that's the verse everybody memorizes, like, first. It's everywhere. You know, you can have a, you can have a, a piece of Scripture that you repeat so many times it loses meaning. But then there are times when you just have to meditate on that and chew it for a little while and just let it stir inside of you and you'll see new things in old scriptures. That's why it's a living word of God, right? So God so loved the world. That one little piece just rocked me this week. And, and I'm just, I'm working at the base. I'm just sitting at my keyboard just typing away and God so loved the world. It's like, Every once in a while, you'll read a scripture and there'll be new words that are bolded to you. It's not really bolded, but it's bolded. And that, the world. He could have just, so God so loved the Jews that he gave his only begotten. No. God so loved the guys. No. God so loved his disciples. No, not quite. He loved the world. It wasn't just the people in this building. It wasn't just the people in this county. That wasn't just the people that you know. He loved the world. Are we getting the world? And so that's why I'm so glad that we belong to a house that believes in missions everywhere, locally, nationally, globally. And we, we support missionaries like Cody and several others, Bill Otten, Laura Roth, that are all over the world spreading the gospel for Jesus. And I'm glad that you guys are able to participate and partner in that. I would encourage you to Partner with missionaries on your own, but we're doing that corporately as well. Amen? Amen? So, Father God, we thank you for good ground. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to participate with you in our community, nationally and globally. We thank you that you choose to partner with us. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
You gotta love a house that don't know when to stop praising. Amen. Kids up to grade five, you can now be dismissed into children's church. Y'all just won't behave. Mm -mm -mm. Have you been blessed so far? In case you were wondering, what's the name of that song? <laughs> mm, that's a good declaration. God's going to get my praise. Oh, man, it's good to be here. I have been preaching a couple weeks, but I feel like I go through withdrawals sometimes. I'm just, like, anxious to get up here and share with y'all. So I hope you're ready for a word. Grab a, a pen or your phone and get ready to take some notes. I'm believing God to uh, encourage us today. Can anybody use some encouragement? Yes. Anybody really need some encouragement? Yes. Good, good. And I'm encouraged that you're here, and we continue to learn about more and more people who are watching us online. So if you're watching us online, we're just blown away. We're just blown away that you would join us this morning. We've had people from different states all over the country who are joining in, and people are telling their friends. So thank you for joining us. We're honored. We're just a little old group of folks, of crazy folks in Cochran, Georgia, but we believe God is up to something. Amen? Amen. Well, uh... So uh, we've had a lot going on. We've talked about idolatry. We talked to Lisa Mills came in on Mother's Day and did her thing and blew it away. Last week we had graduation Sunday. We honored five different high school graduates. Don't they grow up fast? Yes. Too fast. Yes. I mean, it's amazing. Everybody told me when well, you have kids, they're just going to grow up really fast. Parents, is it true? Yes. Is it true? They grow up so fast and um, make you ask a lot of questions. But it's wonderful. And I remember, I, you know, my mom and dad, I, uh, Pastor Larry, the founding pastor, Mama V, they raised me best they knew how, you know. And uh, they, <laughs> when we were growing up, uh, you know, church, some, it, this, I don't know what your church background is. That's the cool thing about House of Grace. Some of you guys are probably from a Baptist background. You were scared to say anything then? Okay. Some of y'all were from the Pentecostal background. Yeah, I knew y'all were going to be like that. And, and then we got Catholics. We got Lutherans. We got folks who said, I didn't even go to church. And uh, well, whatever your background is, you're, you're welcome here. We're glad you're here. Um, but I grew up um, when I was a little kid at two different types of churches. One, a lot of times we were in a church like this, a non-denominational church. It was a little rowdy. And then, but we also had some time where we spent in a, a great Southern Baptist church. My dad started out as a Southern Baptist pastor, and those are our roots, and, um, and I just value that. But I remember we did this thing called Sunday school. Anybody remember Sunday school? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, they used, and I was a little kid, and so they would teach us these songs. And of course, we still teach the kids here. We believe in kids' ministry, and we teach them songs. But I remember a, a song that um, was began to teach me about the love of God when I was like this high. And mom and daddy taught me songs too. I encourage you, even if you can't sing, sing songs with your kids. Teach them the word through song. And we had this song that was, Yes, Jesus loves me. Y'all remember that? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Yeah. That was a good one, wasn't it? Sometimes you just need to ride around your car and sing some old kid songs. And then I have one of my personal favorites that said, Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children. That's our heartbeat at House of Grace. Red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in His sight. Amen? But I had this other song that related to this message, and I, I don't know if it was common everywhere. I don't even know uh, if you've heard of it, but you need to hear it. And the Lord just kept spinning this, this song around in my head that I learned when I was probably three or four years old. And so i um, not trying to like, you know, do some big solo for you, but I'm going to put the, the lyrics on the screen because it just goes right with what we're talking about in the message today. And the song was called, He's Still Working on Me. Does anybody remember that song? Okay, well, if you know it, then you need to help me. He goes, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. 
It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How lovely and patient he must be, but he's still working on me. Isn't that the truth? You know what I really like is line three. It, no, back up, back up, line three. It took him just a week. He made the sun, moon, and stars in a week, but I'm a long-term project. <laughs> that's what that's saying in a really beautiful way. Six days, sun, moon, stars, and Jupiter. You, a long time. <laughs> He's still, still working on you, right? Yes. How lovely and patient he must be because he's still working on me. And then there's a verse. It says this. There really ought to be, that's the next slide, a sign upon my heart that says, don't judge me yet, there's an unfinished part. But I'll be perfect just according to his plan, fashioned by the master's loving hand. Isn't that the truth? So as this song was spinning in my head, I thought the Lord wanted me to share a message with you today and I gave it a fun title because I'm silly and I like to use incorrect English and I thought what's another way to say this and I thought he ain't done with me yet he ain't done with me yet so if you would just say that especially if you're not from Georgia this may be a stretch for you but would you just out loud say he ain't done with me yet yet. all right now and some of y'all need a little more southern attitude it was a little proper but Just the word ain't may be a stretch for you. He ain't done with me yet. You got to say it like a little, he ain't done with me yet. He ain't done with me yet. That's what I want you to remember today. That's what we're going to talk about. (laughs) Amen? If you have your Bibles, uh, don't don't put it on the screen yet, but go ahead and turn to Philippians 3. So as I begin to prepare this, I said, okay, Lord, I know the scripture you have in mind. There's two passages we're going to look at. I began to get the nuggets of truth. I like to give you nuggets and things you can work with this week. But I felt like the Lord said, well, Joe, you need to tell them about some times where you messed up. I said, I'd rather not. (laughs) I'd rather not. Jesus, let's just use people in the Bible if you don't mind. It's not about me. It's about you. And, uh... He said, no, I want you to tell him. So I began to think about it. Well, I said, well, you know, there was maybe, maybe perhaps, perhaps, hypothetically speaking, uh, there may have been a time recently where I was driving through downtown Cochran and there was this lady who really, she was pulling out in her car and she was coming from one of them little alleys. You know better. You know better. You know you can't get out from right there. And so I just played like I couldn't see her. <laughs> I just kept my eyes on that. I know you've never done that. The invisible driver, right? And because you're thinking, you knew better. You could have caught the light just like I did. You try to take a shortcut, that's what you get. Maybe y'all don't struggle with stuff like that. And I thought, how about I share that? And he's like, yeah, it's not quite enough. And I said, well, how about I'll admit that sometimes me and Laura might have a loud disagreement. Like, we disagree a little bit sometimes because we're married for 21 years and I'm still working on her, you know? (laughs) And he was like, nah, they already know that. They've been around you for... (laughs) So he said, why don't you tell them about the doctor's office? I said, nah, Jesus, they don't need to know about that. (laughs) So the short version is, on another planet, far, far away, not in this city, that's the honest truth, not in Cochrane, on another planet, on a person you'll never meet and that I'll never name. Uh, I was in a doctor's office situation and sometimes I forget stuff. I don't know about you. It's happened two or three times in the last decade. And in the doctor's office, the first time I went to this particular doctor's office, uh, they told me, they said, now, do you have your insurance card? Why do they ask that, you know? And I was like, uh, no, I forgot that. You know, I don't come to the doctor a lot. I'm sorry. And they said, well, next time, Mr. Williams, we really need you to bring the insurance card. And I said, no problem. Got it locked in. <laughs> a few months later, we're back at the doctor's office. And apparently, the, I'm going to identify, it was a lady. It was a lady. And uh, if you're watching today, I love you. I love you. Uh, 
with this lady. She said, do you have your insurance card, Mr. Williams? And I said, ah, oh, I am really sorry. I said, but how about, you know, we just take, a, I, I can have a picture of it texted. We'll just, we can work around this. And she said, that's not what I asked you to do. I said, oh. <laughs> All right. And uh, she began to kind of, is berate a word? It berate me? In front of other people. There's a waiting room full of people. There's other staff members. One of my children is with me. I, the only person I forgot who was with me was Jesus. <laughs> and Laura just said a while ago, he goes, wherever you go, whether you like it or not, right? And she began to question. I'm 41 years old, people. And she said, well, why didn't you bring it? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. By that time, I'd have forgot I was saved. <laughs> I had then got upset. <laughs> I did. Here's what Riley says happened. <laughs> Riley says, I took my glasses off and, I, off and I leaned across her counter and I said, why do you think I didn't bring it? <laughs> and she said, because you're a man. <laughs> you can't make this up. <laughs> At that point, I had a choice to make. Either I'm going to jail or I get to keep pastor in House of Grace. But I was upset, and so there were a few more words exchanged, and I explained to her that she was being unkind. I didn't use that word. <laughs> I told her she was rude and that she was mean. I did not cuss her because I'm not where I used to be. I just ain't where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Anybody relate to that? And so we had some words. We sorted it out. We communicated clear expectations with one another. And by the time we left, she, came, she actually made a point to speak to me and say, Mr. Williams, Sorry I was mean to you. I'm mean to everybody. <laughs> and I am on the inside. I said, I believe it. <laughs> and we left and we got in the car. And I couldn't decide whether I had done good or bad. I just knew that I had done better than I used to would have. And I say that to I'm not proud of everything I did in that situation. But I can tell you that I've come far. But I'm just not there yet. And so sometimes, if you thought pastors are perfect, and I hope I, hope I didn't uh, deflate your, your bubble there, bust it, but we're just, we're just on a journey with Jesus. And we're all growing, and we're all in process. And sometimes I blow it. Sometimes I miss the mark. Sometimes I mess up. Now, when I do, I go to Jesus, and I'm like, Lord, sometimes I'm even crazy enough to say, Jesus, if you'll give me another chance, I believe I could honor you better in that situation. And that, that's when I really feel courageous. Other times I'm like, Jesus, please don't ever put me in that situation again because I don't want to embarrass you. Uh, but I am in process, and he ain't done with me yet. But I just believe that maybe that may, story might make you go, well, I'm going to be all right. If the pastor about lost it at the doctor's office, I'm going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? Look at your neighbor and say, he ain't done with me yet. I want to look at this text in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to put it on the screen out of the New Living Translation because I love the way a particular couple of words read in Philippians 3, verse 12. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. If anybody would have handled the situation better, anybody besides Jesus, I wish it had been Paul at the doctor that day. But it wasn't. God sent Joey. I did the best I could. And, but Paul, he's talking about maturing in Christ and getting to a point where he's growing in perfection. Now, when you see perfection in the New Testament, the word perfect means mature. Mature, develop. God is trying to, that's when that song said, I'll be perfect. Good luck at that. He's saying you'll be mature. And that's what he's working on. There's still some things in me that need some maturing. Amen? And so Paul said this. And you've heard this passage. Listen to it with new ears today. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. That encourages me already. If Paul ain't there yet, 
we're going to be all right. He said, but I press on. Would you say press on? Press on. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Now, if you look that word up in the Greek, press on means to aggressively chase like a hunter pursuing a catch. Like when you shoot a deer and it runs off in the woods and you're letting it die, which I didn't do right last year and I lost that deer. But and you pursue a catch. This is masculine sportsman uh, warfare type language in this whole passage. He says, I press on. He's showing that you have to press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So we see Paul's mindset as one of struggling and pursuing, doing whatever he's got to do, not to be in this same place next year. Yeah. It's okay to be here today. It's not okay to be here next year. Right. We're growing, right? And he said, no, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus. Would you say focus? focus. I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past. Yes. That's a big key, right? Yes. Forgetting the past. Somebody say, forget about it. Forget about it. Look that word up in the Greek. It means to overlook, to fail to notice. Fail to, I don't even notice. I don't even think about my, my past is behind me. I, whether it was good or bad. So you don't need to just forget the bad things you did in the past. Sometimes you need to quit living in the victories of the past. Some of us are saying, well, I was so close to Jesus in 1995. 1995 is long gone. What about today? Well, I grew up in the church. What about today? Well, I remember God used to talk to me and I used to pray and I used to... Fa what about today? Forget the past or you won't keep growing. And looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on. There it is again. He's saying, I struggle, I reach, I strain forward to reach the end of the stands that we're in process. Amen? Now keep listening. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. Paul is so cool. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. <laughs> In today's language, he was saying, if you disagree, God will straighten you out. He'll fix your thinking. You'll see in time. God's going to keep working with you. But here's what really surprised me in the NLT. The verse 16, the last one says, but we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Yeah. Hear me. You, if you're walking with the Lord and you've been walking with the Lord, you've already made some progress. The enemy is the accuser of the brethren, and he will never bring up your progress unless he's trying to create pride and get you to stop focusing on the future. Otherwise, he's not going to bring up progress. He's always going to bring up problems. He's going to show you failures where you didn't quite. He's going to say, what about the doctor's office lady? What are you doing up there talking? You don't deserve. You're not worthy. They, if they really find out who you are, <laughs> if they find out about your past, they won't let you sing on the praise team. They won't let you be an usher. If they find out the truth about you, it's going to be bad. You know what? That's the enemy. That's the enemy. He's trying to get you to look back. But Paul says, I, listen, guys, Paul killed Christians. I doubt you've done that. He was persecuting them to the point where they were being tortured and killed. And he said, you know what? I don't focus on where I used to be. I focus on where I'm going. If you're going to make progress, which God is calling you to do, and he'll help you make it, you've got to quit looking back. Yes. Amen? Amen? But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. The devil is a progress stealer. Amen? <coughs> and then... I'd like to show you in, um, well, in, in Philippians 1.6, I don't know if I put that one on the screen, Chief, but let me just show you that. Philippians, I feel like you need to hear that one. It took Philippians out of my Bible for a second there. Okay, Philippians 1.6 says this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is going to continue the good work that he started in us as long as we allow him and partner with him to do so and submit so that he can work this thing out. He's going to, how long is it going to take till Jesus comes? It's going to be a minute. Well, it could be today, but either way, he's going to be working on us until the end. But we got to let him do the work, right? All right, let me show you a picture of something. Let me show that picture that I've got there. Yeah. Oh, I should say something. 
This is not anything to do with me and Laura having another. <laughs> Get your mind right. <laughs> yes, yeah. We got five and our quiver is full. But so this picture, what, what is this a picture of, guys? Baby. Say it again. What is it a picture of? Baby. A baby. A baby. This is a picture of a baby. Uh, it's just like this is a, a, a sonogram at eight weeks. And let me show you. Riley, would you come here for a second? This is one of my babies. Come on up here, babe. Okay. Now, the first picture I saw of Riley looked just like that. Now, what is the difference between that Riley and this Riley? Time and development. Time and development. But everything you see right here is in that picture. Everything you see, and, and I know that people want to debate all that stuff, but the Bible's clear on this, okay? The Bible's clear. I'm going to show you in Jeremiah 1 in a minute. But everything you see here, you see it there, you see it, but you can't see it because it hasn't been developed yet. But the potential and the seed and the plan of God for her body and for everything that you see is right there in that photo. But it's hidden from you because it hasn't been worked out. There are things in you that God, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and you're born again and you're a follower of Christ, He places Himself in you. And everything that He needs, everything that you're supposed to be, everything that you're called to become, He has placed it in you because He placed Himself in you. It just needs some time to develop. It just needs to be worked out. You may be seated. Thank you. She's beautiful. You'll think she looks like me and her mama. Let me show you this in Scripture. In Jeremiah, I'm going to have this on the screen as well, I believe. Jeremiah 1, uh, ch uh, chapter 1, verse 4 through 10. Now listen carefully. You, you may be unfamiliar with the book of Jeremiah, or you may have you know, had this one memorized to a song, but listen to it again. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the what? Womb, I knew you. Before you were what? born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. All right, let's, let's look at this. So if you were doing a timeline, I, I like to think in timelines sometimes. So God spent, well, first of all, keep in mind, God spent nine months developing your body in your mama's womb. He's going to spend the rest of your life developing your heart, developing your character. If you're wondering, what, why, why, what's going on with me? How come I'm not there? Well, God's still working with you. He ain't done with you yet. But if you think through the timeline, what I'm seeing is first thing that happened. The, this is how you got here. This, listen, listen, listen. This is how you got here. According to the scripture, the first thing that happened was God thought of you. I don't know if you just heard that. The God of the universe thought of you. I didn't say he thought about you. He thought of you. You need to chew on that at lunch. He didn't just think about you because you're already here and he remembered you. He already knew you before there was a you. He thought of you. His thought was the first thing that ever happened to make you happen. So you didn't happen just because two people fell in love. That was part of the process. But you happened because God decided to think of you to make you happen. So it says he thought of us. Now that tells you that you're not an accident. See, you're not an accident. No matter what the circumstances were on earth, in heaven, God thought of you, and that's why you're here. That alone gives you value. Why are you here? Because God thought of you. Next of all, after he thought about you, 
It says, he called you. So he thought of you. He said, I'm going to make a Freddy. And then he said, but before I do, I'm going to go ahead and give him purpose. He didn't just say, we'll figure it out as we go. I don't know. Maybe give him a harmonica or something, you know? <laughs> no. It says, but he's thought of Freddy. Then he said, I've called you. I've given you a purpose. And so your purpose is already stamped on you. And then he says, now in the womb, I'm going to have two people come together to partner with me to make a Freddy. But it was God's idea, not their idea. Even if they had an idea, God had it first. And they come together, and that's wonderful. Uh, and then God says, now I'm going to begin to form him in his mother's womb. I'll take nine months to form him. So I've thought of him. I've formed him. I've called him. Then he was born. All that happened before he was ever born, before anybody, before he ever went, way, 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 and they smacked him, you know, this, you know. All that happened. Are you seeing the significance of this? You have that same significance God thought of you. He called you, gave you purpose, and then he formed you in the mother's womb. Before you ever were presented, it's a boy, it's a girl. God did all that. God did all that. That's how important you are. Now, after that, you were born, but you were born unsaved because you were born into a fallen world. So even though God thought of you, he called you to a kingdom purpose, he formed you in the mother's womb, but then he had to release you to this world and you had a fallen nature. So at that moment, the rescue begins. And he says, I'm going to pursue him. I'm going to pursue that young woman. I'm going to pursue that child. And they may be in this kind of household or that kind of parenting or good situations and bad situations, whatever country on there. And God said, oh, I'm not letting go. I'm not giving up because you are my idea. You can run, but you can't hide because I thought of you. I already got a purpose for you. I was hands-on while you were in the womb. And when you were born, I had to let you go into this world, into this sinful system. But I'm coming for you because you are my idea. I don't want you to be stolen. I'm going to pursue you. And if you've given your heart to Jesus, that means he caught you. And once he catches you, he begins to father you. And he begins to develop. You see, because he developed your body in the womb, but now he's going to spend the rest of your life developing your heart. But now he's on the inside working this thing out because the Spirit of Christ lives in you. How is this going to happen? It's going to happen through surrender, submission, obedience. And God's going to just work things out. And things that you said, I'll never be able to stop so-and-so. God will say, yes, you can. Let me work it out. Sometimes work it out means work it out. That's how this happens. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I thought of you. You are a manifested thought of God the Father. That should blow your mind. Chew on that this week. That's one of those, <laughs> we joked in Hawkinsville about somewhere where the pastor was reading through the Psalms, and if you're reading through the Psalms, there's this word that the psalmist would insert every now and then that means to stop and ponder the truth. He, and the word is selah, selah. And it means, whoa, that was deep. You should just take a moment and think on that and digest it. And the pastor was preaching in a little country church, and he said, say la, and everybody said, la! Uh, but they didn't quite understand what that word meant. So sometimes in Hawksville, I say, say la, and they say, la! But that's a say la moment. You should ponder that. You should ponder that, that God formed you, knew you, called you, before your timeline on earth even began. You have purpose, amen? amen. Let's talk about being patient, being patient. These are just a few nuggets, because... I know that I'm in process. I'm usually more patient with me than I am with you. Do you struggle with that? Anybody else? I mean, like, I, I got all kinds of excuses on why I haven't got my stuff together, but you need to get your stuff together. Right? I'm lenient on me. I've got excuses for me. But you, my goodness, come on. How long has it been now? Do you deal with that? So we got to be patient, not just with ourselves, but patient with others. So I wrote this down. Be willing to wait on the development. See, if, if you're going to be around people ever in your life, you're going to have to learn to wait on their development. Be willing to work 
on the development of yourself. You know, it's not automatic. This thing of sanctification, this thing of growing up, that nine months in the womb, it was like just on autopilot. I mean, mamas, let's be honest. Y'all just, I'm not, I never had, I'm not going to, I should be careful. I know you're working, mamas. I know you're working. Don't kill me. But I'm just saying, it's kind of just happening. You know, you're eating, sleeping, throwing up, and, and the process, it's just happening. And, um, but once you get out, man, it, there's no more autopilot. When you get surrendered to Jesus, some of it, it, a few things, sometimes God just takes it away and just works it out. And you're like, wow, I'm different. Praise the Lord. But most of it, most of it, that's not how it goes, is it? It's a process. It's a process. He's working on it. And he's growing me and helping me and developing me. Be willing to work on the development. Be willing to love during the development. If you're going to be with people who are in process, i.e. everyone, you got to be willing to love them even when they're not developed all the way yet. Be patient with people because God is. Be patient with people because God is. There's this, uh, there's this situation. You know, even church folks can get on your nerves. Just look at the person beside you and say, mmm. <laughs> There's this scripture in the Bible. You might not know about this one. Check this out. In Acts chapter 15, I hope I did this one. Did I do this one too? If I can't remember. Acts chapter 15. Is there one of those? If it didn't, I'll read it to you. Check this out. In Acts chapter 15, y'all have heard of Paul, right? He's the guy. 13 books in the New Testament. Kind of got it going on. He's an apostle. He takes these different guys to partner with him on these missionary journeys. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36, okay, there's a little drama. I know you've never seen drama in the church, but in the Bible, they had a little bit. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, that's his right-hand guy, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So they've done missionary trips. And now he's like, hey, let's go check on all the churches we planted and see how they're doing and encourage them. And Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. And, um, but Paul insisted that they should not take them. Do we have that? Okay, yeah. Let me read it out of this version on the screen. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pephalia and had not gone with them to the work. And there was a sharp disagreement. What kind of disagreement? Sharp. So that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. All right, so here's what went down. Previously, Paul, Barnabas, they had taken John Mark on this missionary trip with them. And not long into it, John Mark's... We don't know all the details, but John Mark said, you know what, guys? I'm going back home. Paul was like, you're doing what? You know, what, are you not committed to this? And what's the problem? And so they, we, we speculate, but we know there was tension. John Mark went home. Paul, Paul goes on on the mission. And so years go by, or time goes by, and Paul said, Barnabas, let's go back and check on our churches. And Barnabas, what does Barnabas' name mean, by the way, if you know? Son of encouragement. The name Barnabas means son of encouragement. So you got Paul the practical and son of encouragement trying to decide who to take with him on the trip. And he says, you know what? I know John Mark kind of blew it last time, but let's give him another chance. I mean, come on. Paul said, give him another chance. Send the boy to the house. Barnabas said, well, come on. No, seriously. And Paul and Barnabas disagreed. Now, nobody slapped each other or cussed each other or anything like that, but they had a sharp disagreement to the point where Paul said, if you want him that bad, you take him. And Barnabas said, I will. I don't know if he did his neck like that, <laughs> but I just insert that in because that's how I would have done it. And, and so he said, fine, fine, bye, bye. And then Paul takes Silas and Barnabas takes John Mark. So if Paul and Barnabas had a situation where they had somebody who was in progress that wasn't quite making it yet to their level of expectation, and they actually had a disagreement, what I'm seeing is there's going to be situations in your life where you're going to have to decide, am I going to be the Paul or be the Barnabas? And there's times for both. Neither one was rebuked by the scripture. In fact, the, the story follows Paul. Uh, 
But I'm saying there are times when you need to be a Barnabas and say, you know what, I know they're not there yet, but he ain't done with them yet. He ain't done. I'm going to choose to be patient with them. Can I get an amen for that? Like somebody needed it. And so it's cool, though, in 2 Timothy, how this, how this came back around. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here's how this happened later, okay? 2 Timothy 4, uh, 9 through 11. 2 Timothy 4, verse 9 through 11. Did I do that one? Okay, no. So Paul's writing Timothy a letter telling him to bring some people to help Paul out. This is years down the road, okay? Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Chrysens for Galatia, Titus for Dal Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Who, Paul? Who did you want, Paul? Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is what? Useful to me for ministry. Okay, just a few years earlier, Paul's like, I'm done with him. And Barnabas says, no, let's give him another chance. He's, God ain't done with him yet. Paul said, you take him, you do it. But now down the road, Paul's in, you know, writing Timothy and saying, bring this and bring that. He said, but specifically, I want to ask for somebody. John Mark. The one that I had given up on is the one who would be most helpful to me in ministry. That's hope for me and you, right? I've been a John Mark. I've turned too early. I've quit on people. I've let God down. But because somebody was willing to say, he, he, they, God ain't done with him yet. Then later down the road, they say, you know what, that guy right there. Sometimes it's about season and development and going through the process. If we could understand that God's working us from glory to glory and season to season, and so is he with other people. Amen. 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 So let me flip this coin over and then I'll, I'll close it. But so we're talking about being patient with ourselves, being patient with other people. They're in process. However, however, um, there is a flip side of this. It, it, I got to balance it out. I just felt like this morning the Lord said, make sure you, you flip that coin over and balance it out and explain there are boundaries. There are healthy boundaries that need to be set in our life. If you have people that are uh, taking advantage or hurting or crossing the line, you, you fill in the blank. You know what I'm trying to say. If it's an unhealthy situation, sometimes you, you, you can still be patient with someone and you can still be supportive of that person, but you may have to separate yourself from that person. Is this making sense? There's a thousand scenarios, but I'm saying there are times where you need healthy boundaries. I, I wrote it like this. It, it, it doesn't mean that we're enablers. And, and you can separate and still support sometimes. But what you don't do, what you don't do, I would write this down. Don't gossip about them. Yes. Selah. <laughs> you ain't got to put it on Facebook. Well, I just had to separate. I won't name no names, but I just had... Sometimes you just got to pull back from people. <sighs> Everybody knows you're talking about. <laughs> oh, I didn't name any names. Why'd you say anything? Because you wanted attention. Say la. Don't gossip. Don't get offended. Don't get offended and don't give up on people. Sometimes we may have to separate from a situation and put healthy boundaries in place, but we still can't talk bad about them. We still can't get offended in our own heart and let the root of bitterness come in. And we still can't give up on them. Now that may mean they don't get to keep slapping me in the face, but I'm still going to be praying for God's best. I'm not going to give up because I don't have the right to give up on them but I still might have to have boundaries. Is that making sense? Yes. I hope so. I hope that makes sense. You've got to love people in their process. Um, if you look at our floors, does anybody notice that the floors are different this week than last week? Yes. They are. Um, you're like, really? Wow. Uh, <laughs> but they actually are. Um, see, at first we had the old carpet that needed to be removed. Its season was up and it was damaged and stained. And we, we took that carpet up and then I wanted it to be like one Sunday, and then y'all would see an ugly floor, and the very next Sunday, y'all would all go, whoa, look at that. 
but it didn't work out like that. It turned into, then they had a problem with the concrete, and one plan fell through, and that contractor said, I can't work with this concrete, and this happened, and that happened. And then it came into two Sundays. Sometimes there are things in your life where you think, this is going to be quick, man. God's just going to do this quick. It's going to be so cool. It's going to be quick, and it's going to be awesome, and we're just going to give him all the glory. I can't wait to testify. Well, you might have to go, just get comfortable for me. It might take a minute for God to do some renovation in your heart and in your life and in your family and in your work situation. See, sometimes it takes a minute. And then the guy came in and he said, you know what, I can, we, we, I can do this carpet and we're going to do it. We said, yes, that's God's plan. Okay, do it, blah, blah, blah. And he said, but it's going to take some prep. He said, we're going to have to do more prep on this floor, more preparation for what you want it to look like when I'm done. So he spent all week in here this week doing all the stuff you see. I don't even know what to call it. It's stuff. And there's things, and he would spread that out, and then he would come in with a sander and just grind it off. And but There are things that God's got. There was holes in here that he had to make smooth. There's things in your life. There's things in your heart. There's wounds from the past. There's some, insta- there's some stuff that God's like, we're going to get there, but it's going to be a process. It's going to be a process, see? And he says, I got to fill that in. And then I, I got to fill it in with my love. And then I got to come back with some people in your life that you're not exactly awesomely in love with. And I'm going to use them like sandpaper <laughs> to just grind on rough spots off of you. I'm going to make you ready, but it's going to be a process. Yeah. Here she comes now. Brace yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I'm telling y'all, when y'all come in here next Sunday, you're going to see the new floor in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but there was a cost. It took an investment. It took time. It took preparation. In fact, when I came in here, I saw that man doing this right here on his knees. You may have to get on your knees. You may have to get on your knees if you want to get where God is taking you. It might cost you something. You may have, this morning we heard about sometimes confession. Sometimes you got to be honest with somebody before you can get over something. That's just some practical stuff for you. But the kind of church I want to be in, I don't know about you, I need folks that are patient. I need to be surrounded by some people. That's why I'm glad I got a bunch of folks here with issues. Amen. This is a place where you can just come and be real and say, I got issues, but I ain't where I used to be. He ain't done with me, but he's done a lot in me. And we're in process and we come along and and we know, we know it's just a matter of time where somebody's going to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, sit in your seat. How dare they? Something's going to happen. They may ask your child to stop running and say, how dare they speak to my kid? Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. If you stick around long enough, there'll be some sandpaper rubbing up against you. And you need them. You need them. I need them. But at the same time, when I mess up, I need people that are patient with me. And they say, the boy's in process. God ain't done with him yet. He said the wrong thing. He did the wrong thing. But he loves the Lord, and he loves me. I need you to remember that. That if I don't do everything you wanted me to do, perhaps it was the Lord's will. But maybe I say something. Maybe I just make an honest mistake. You'll probably make one sooner or later, too. And you'll want people that'll be patient with you. And they'll say, you know what? The boy's still in process. That woman, she's doing the best she knows how. You should have met her a few years ago. Because I've seen God do a work in her. He's in process. I want to be in a marriage where my wife is patient with me. Sometimes I blow it and I need a lot of grace. Anybody married relate to that? Sometimes I'm like, you know what? That was the stupidest thing I could have ever said. I am stupid. Please forgive me. I need that grace because I make mistakes. Your kids, they want parents. They need parents who are patient with them. Sometimes we place 12-year-old expectations on a 6-year-old child. Sometimes we place adult expectations on a 13-year-old. Now, sometimes they, I'm all, you know me, I'm tough on parenting. I'm all about grooming and raising and training. But I'm telling you, sometimes we get it wrong. 
Sometimes they need grace. Sometimes I have to remember that they're still in process. And I remember years ago, we talked about progress is in the process. I want to be in a workplace where people are patient with me. I'm not saying I'm going to be late every day. That's different. That's just lazy. But I'm talking about when we make honest mistakes, we can say, I messed up. I can work with that guy. I can work with somebody who says I messed up. It's the guy who hides it I want to fire. You know? I want to be in that kind of environment. And I was, uh, I was thinking about football. I love football. Jesus loves football. Amen. There'll be football in heaven. And uh, I don't know which team it's going to be. <laughs> we may have split over that. But I was thinking about if you know anything about football, what puts numbers on the scoreboard? What is the answer? Touchdowns. Would you just say that like it's a Greek word? Touchdowns. Touchdowns. For some teams, it is Greek. Uh, but <laughs> touchdowns are what put numbers on the scoreboard. But do you know what some of the best coaches in history focus on? Not touchdowns, first downs. First downs, because the game of football is broken up into increments. It's broken up into phases. It's broken up into seasons. It's, it's, and actually, even the, if you get a 10-yard first down, they'll give you four chances to get. This game is full of grace and mercy. It's from the Bible. <laughs> you get four chances to get 10 yards. If you get it, they say, first down, start over. You're like, yes. All right, all you got to do is keep getting first downs if you just did it 10 times, you'll get a touchdown. It will automatically happen. And great coaches focus on the fundamentals that produce first downs because they know touchdowns are a result of first downs. And even the first down, you got 10 yards to get it. You got four chances. I didn't go to you know, college for math or anything, but I'm pretty sure if you divide 10 by four, two and a half yards, let's get crazy and go for three. I can fall three yards. On accident, you know? <laughs> now, not if people are tackling me, but three yards. I mean, boy, that maybe? All you got to do is get three yards every time, and you'll score a first down. What am I trying to say? Just a little bit of progress. Just a little bit of progress. Sometimes you're mad at yourself because you keep trying to throw the ball 40 yards. How about I just fall forward three yards every day? Just say, you know what, I'm not going to read my Bible for two hours tomorrow because I haven't read it in two months. But I will read it for five minutes. I haven't prayed in two weeks, so I'm not going to say that I'm praying and fasting eight meals this week. But how do I start on my lunch break while I eat my sandwich? I start praying for somebody. Maybe I make a start somewhere and start getting three-yard gains. And when you start getting three-yard gains, before long you'll say, ah, I got a first down. I got a first down. And the team's over there, yes, yes. And you know what? You need to know your coach, your heavenly father, he's not over there going, well, that wasn't a big enough game. He was going, that's my boy. That's my girl. Three-yard gain. Look at him. He's out there. Take a picture of that. Three-yard gain. <laughs> he's got you on Instagram. Three-yard, look at my boy. Three yards, four times in a row. That's a first down. And if he keeps going, he's going to get a touchdown. He's going to get a touch. And I'm telling you, God is so patient with us. Would you stand to your feet and let's just celebrate the goodness of God together? He is so good. Just say this. He ain't done with me yet. Some of you need to work on your ain't, but I think you got the message. Mm. I can't wait to see that floor. Would you just join hands across the aisle? And we're going to pray for the person beside us. We don't know what they came in here with, but we know we, what, what we want them to leave with. We want them to leave encouraged, healed, knowing that they're loved, knowing that before they were even born, God thought of them, and he picked a purpose for them. He called them, and then he formed them before you were even on the planet, Amen. or at least out of the womb. Jesus, we pray for the person next to us. Lord, we pray that if they haven't decided to follow you as their Savior, that they would surrender their heart to you right now, that they would, just like the old song says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I pray that we would make decisions this morning, courageous decisions, not just a bailout plan, not just a 911 to heaven, 
but a decision to follow you. A decision to decide that you're smarter, you're better, you know more, and we want to surrender to you. Whatever that means and looks like, we're willing to spend the rest of our life investing in that relationship, submitting to you as our Lord and Savior, reading the Bible, talking to you, choosing to obey your word no matter what the world tells us to do. A true follower of you is what we want to be, Jesus. Lord, we pray for healing in this house. We know that house of grace means Bethesda, which means the healing waters. And we just declare your healing waters over this place, that there, there would be bodies that are healed, that there would be hearts that are emotionally healed, and that you would just, just place your kiss upon um, this family. And we pray for protection this week. We pray for wisdom and favor. We pray safety over travels. Many people are on vacations and heading to vacations. Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe. And Lord, I also pray that we would take a vacation geographically, but not spiritually. That we would not disconnect from Jesus because you're not a burden. You're the carrier of our burdens. If we are taking a vacation from you, then we have confused who you really are and how good you are. So Lord, let us spend our vacations even with you, talking to you uh, and doing whatever things that you lead us to do to spend time with you and minister to you and even minister to others. I just feel like some of you need to be reminded that on your vacation, you're still a kingdom agent and that there are people where you're going this summer that don't know Jesus. And just because you're on vacation from your job and your yard and all your responsibilities here, you are still a missionary ordained and called by God. If you read the rest of Jeremiah 1, it says, I have called you to be a prophet to the nations. Don't be afraid of what you will say. I will put my words in your mouth. Would you give him your mouth when you're on vacation this year? Lord, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yes, if I can have a few men help us move the chairs so we can get that carpet installed. Hey,